In today's video, I'm going to go over five perilous mistakes that many new Pathfinder players end up making. And some of these mistakes players will make without ever even noticing them, and therefore doing them over and over and over again. So hopefully this video will help set newer Pathfinder players on the right path in this fairly complex CRPG. For more Pathfinder content, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Links to my Twitter and my Discord server will be below. Let's get right into it. Number 1. Ranged Weapons Many of your party members in Wrath of the Righteous will be better suited for hanging out on the back lines of combat, and therefore rely on ranged attacks to deal damage. You may even find that some of your more spellcasting focused characters can also benefit from using ranged weapons, as it allows them to conserve the use of their spell slots but still deal damage. Well, one of the biggest and most confusing mistakes that players make is not understanding the difference between bows and crossbows, and even the different types of bows. So first let me point out that your character's dexterity modifier is added to all ranged attack rolls, so crossbows and bows. Attack rolls in this game are simply the behind the scenes RNG computation that determines whether you hit or miss your target, it has nothing to do with damage. So the higher that your dexterity modifier is, the better chance that you have at landing your shots with all of your ranged weapons. Now your strength modifier will apply on all bow damage if negative, and only on composite bows if positive. For crossbows, strength has no effect at all. So what this means is that with a negative strength modifier, that negative number will be added to damage rolls with all bows. And if this is your case, you may want to consider using a crossbow for that character to avoid this damage reduction. A positive strength modifier will only be applied to damage rolls for one specific type of bow called the composite bow. So if you have a character with a positive strength modifier who can also use composite bows, such as Lan, you're better off using a composite bow over a short or regular long bow, or even a crossbow, so you can get that extra strength modifier added to your damage. I'll also mention briefly that thrown weapons also benefit from a positive strength modifier to their damage roll, so this may also be an option for your characters with positive strength modifiers. Now of course you have to consider what weapons your character is even able to use in the first place, and also keep in mind that there are feats and weapon enchantments that can make this topic a bit more complex, but I'll leave it at those basics for now. Number 2. Ranged Attacks while on the subject of ranged weapons, we might as well talk about ranged attacks, specifically about the penalty that you'll take when shooting at a target that's engaged in melee combat. Generally speaking, if you shoot a ranged weapon or use a ray spell on an enemy that's engaged in melee combat, you'll take a minus 4 penalty to your base attack roll, which makes it much harder to land your shots. Unless you check the combat log, you may not even know that you're getting this penalty. The idea behind this is that it should be harder to hit a target that is in close proximity to a friendly target that you absolutely don't want to hit. So how do you overcome this rather frustrating penalty that keeps making you miss? Well the first and most obvious answer is to not shoot at enemies that are engaged in melee combat. But that doesn't really solve the problem because many times you do in fact want to focus fire on one enemy. In this case, the solution is by picking up the precise shot feat, which gets rid of that minus 4 penalty. But keep in mind that to get this feat, you must first pick up the point blank feat. If you're playing a character that is heavily based on ranged weapon attacks, you're going to want to pick up these feats likely as early as possible to avoid all of the missed shots that you're going to get without them. If you're playing a spellcaster, you may only need this feat if you plan on doing a build that relies heavily on spells that roll against the target's touch armor class, which is mostly the ray type spells in this game. With that said, many spells in the game don't roll against the target's armor class, such as spells that require saving throws like Grease or Web, or even Summon spells, so be sure that you don't waste your valuable feat choices on the point blank and precise shot feat if you don't think you really really need it. Number 3. Attacks of Opportunity one of the most common mistakes that new players make, especially when playing in real time with pause mode, is triggering enemy attacks of opportunities. Attacks of opportunities in Pathfinder are additional attacks that are granted to you 
or an enemy in this case, when an enemy that is within your reach of melee combat is doing something that may distract them from fully defending themselves, such as casting a spell, firing a ranged weapon, or moving away which causes you to turn your back or side to an opponent. Sometimes it may be necessary to take an attack of opportunity, but many times it just comes down to a player's lack of knowledge on how they trigger. So how do you avoid making the mistake of giving attacks of opportunities? The first thing you can do is toggle on the acrobatics mobility skill icon before doing an action that may provoke an attack of opportunity. Every character has this acrobatic mobility skill, which can be found under the abilities button above the skill bar. If you activate this, you will move at half speed, but your character will now do a mobility skill check before taking an attack of opportunity. And if they succeed on this mobility skill check, they will actually avoid the attack of opportunity completely. This is obviously best suited for characters with higher dexterity modifiers, and of course more points into the mobility skill. Other ways to avoid attack of opportunities may include doing a 5 foot step and to activate the 5 foot step in turn based mode, simply hold down shift before moving and then you'll be able to move 5 feet away from your opponent avoiding an attack of opportunity. But doing this special 5 foot step will cost you a full round action, meaning your move and your standard action. Keep in mind though that enemies with longer reaching weapons like glaives may still be able to do an attack of opportunity on you. When casting spells or reading scrolls while an enemy is in your face, you can actually turn on the acrobatic mobility skill icon again, and this will allow your spellcaster to do two concentration checks to avoid the attack of opportunity, as opposed to the one that you already get by default. Now there are also other ways to avoid attacks of opportunities with feats such as the point blank master feat which allows a character to choose a type of ranged weapon that will no longer provoke attacks of opportunities. There's also the feats called combat casting and combat mobility which give you boosts to your concentration checks and mobility checks when attempting to avoid an attack of opportunity and there's also more in the game. If you want a more detailed in-depth explanation on attacks of opportunities I'll put a link below to a Steam guide that channel member and moderator of the channel, Baraz, recently put together. One thing I want to quickly point out is that currently taking potions while in melee reach of an enemy combatant does not set off attacks of opportunities despite the game actually telling us that it does. Number 4. I wanted to make this one the mistake of not pre-buffing your party before combat encounters begin, but I already did talk about that in my recent 10 tips for combat video, I'll leave a link to that below. The number 4 mistake is going to be players failing to understand everything that comes with wearing different types of armor. And because of this, many players will equip armor based solely on what looks good and has a high armor class number. The armor class number is of course very important, but you need to make sure that you also understand what armor check penalty, arcane spell failure, and max dexterity means. If you're wearing armor with an armor check penalty, which is most armor in the game that is heavier than leather, that negative number will be added to many of your character's strength and dexterity based skill checks that they end up doing. So if you do an athletics check to move something, or a mobility check to avoid an attack of opportunity, or even a stealth check which is a dexterity based skill, you stand much less of a chance for succeeding if you have armor that gives you an armor check penalty. Consider taking off the armor before doing a check, or just find armor that better suits that character. Arcane spell failure is the chance of spell failure when the wearer attempts to cast an arcane spell. So if it says 35, that character has a 35% chance of their arcane spells outright failing. Keep in mind that casters such as clerics and paladins use divine spells, so this does not affect those classes. But classes like wizards and sorcerers that use mostly arcane spells should probably be wearing armor that makes those spells less likely to fail. Max Dexterity is telling us that this specific type of armor will limit the amount of dexterity that can be added to your armor class. So if you have a max dexterity of 3 on the armor that you're wearing, and your character has a dexterity modifier of 4, only 3 of that dexterity modifier will be added to your armor class because of that armor. So make sure to take into account more than just the armor class of the armor that you're wearing, and ensure that each character is wearing armor that doesn't have a huge negative effect on their role and specialties in the party. Number 5. Selling all of your weapons. 
While it is a great idea to get rid of unused inventory to clear up space, players may find themselves selling unused weapons that may actually prove to be quite useful in future combat situations. You may be using a longsword that has good damage potential, and maybe even has an enchantment on it, and therefore you want to sell every other longsword that you pick up that doesn't have an equal or greater damage potential. This can actually be a mistake though, because just like players wearing armor based solely off of an armor class number, with weapons you want to make sure that you look at what those weapons offer outside of just the damage potential. For example, some weapons may have the cold iron quality associated with them, while others may not. If you come across an enemy that has damage reduction with the exception of cold iron, well that cold iron sword that you sold because of its lower damage potential would actually end up doing more damage against this specific type of enemy. Also keep in mind what type of damage in general that each weapon deals, such as most swords dealing slashing damage, while maces deal bludgeoning damage. Many creatures in the game will have damage reduction to different types of weapons and weapon qualities, and you should make sure that you have a somewhat decent selection of weapons with different qualities to choose from before just selling everything to grab that gold. This can also be applied to spellcasters, as magic users should also make sure that they have a decent selection of different types of spells to choose from, as opposed to just doing nothing but, let's say, fire damage. And that'll be it for today's video. Thank you guys so much to those of you that made it all the way to the end. I really do appreciate it. Make sure to check out my 10 tips for combat video if you missed that. Hopefully that will prove helpful, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.